Hey, Rocky Fork, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will stay connected by downloading our app. How many people uh, have already broken your resolution, <laughs> right? I mean, we're like less than 12 hours, right? <laughs> Whatever that thing was, we're past that. I'm on to the next thing, right? Yeah. I've got to the place where I don't even make them anymore, right? I'm that old, right? I looked up the five most common resolutions that would be done for this year, right? Exercise, don't do that. Lose weight, I should. I noticed that my shirts are shrinking. Spend, <laughs> spend time with family and friends. How many of you are at a point right now where if you had to spend one more day with extended family, you're ready to move, right? Save more money. That's a good one, right? Uh, here's one that a lot of people think about this time of year is, how do I get better at my job? Or how do I find another job to get better at, right? Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want to be healthier? Who wouldn't want to lose a little bit of weight? Who wouldn't... Uh, who wouldn't want to have a little more money in your, in your account or, or, or savings? Who wouldn't want to spend more time with the people you love? Who wouldn't want to be better at work and what they do, right? Those are all top five, right? But you and I know, and here's this kind of the theme, you and I both know that most New Year resolution, or resolutions are broken in the first week, Right? Here's what I would say. You will do the things you want to do. Good or bad, you will see them through. You have to want to. Right? I mean, that's really the heart of it, right? If I want something bad enough, I will turn the heavens upside down to make them happen. Good or bad, I know what it takes to achieve those things. So sometimes we set really lofty goals and then we feel like we really let ourselves down. That's okay. What if we set goals, good goals, that would bring us closer to Christ? Is that, is that too lofty? I don't think so. I think that's healthy. I think that's probably right there in line in the, in the medium that we need to be at. That's the place we need to be. As we continue to look and study through the Gospel of Luke, I want to kind of shift. We, we talked in the first couple of weeks about the beginning, right? And in, in the beginning, there was this uh, piece of scriptures, that, that the first three uh, chapters where Luke talks about when Jesus came, when he's a baby, when he grows up, and, and we kind of walk through. We call that Christmas, right? Yeah, the Christmas story is found in there. This morning, I want to shift to a, a, a more personal or face-to-face -face interactions with Jesus, which we're going to see in the book of Luke. The first one we're going to talk about this morning is one that we're not likely to bring up and think about as a personal face-to-face -face interaction, but it happens between Jesus and Satan, right? And the reason why I want to talk about it today is because often we have great intentions, we have great purpose and mission and goals, but temptation comes in, right? And it pulls us off of those goals, off our mission, off of our purpose, the things that we want to achieve or become closer to Christ with. Satan intercedes and tempts us, right? He does the same with Jesus. And I want you to see that this morning. Satan's purpose is to tempt Jesus and pull him off mission, to circumvent why he came, to, to offer shortcuts that will make Jesus' ministry easier, right? And, and you'll see what I'm talking about when we start talking about this, 
right? Because we all like the shortcut. We like the easy button, don't we? And you give me the path of least resistance where I don't have to suffer or I don't have to hurt or I don't have to pay for anything, then that's the one I want. The devil does a really good job of tempting us, keeping us from doing the things that we want to do in Christ's name. Let's go back to Luke chapter 3 first to kind of catch us up. Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, When all the people were being baptized. Now, John was the one baptizing people out by the Jordan River because there was much water there, the Scripture says. You, you can't baptize someone without a lot of water. Right? They need to be immersed under the water in order to be baptized. That's why John's at this spot baptizing people. Jesus was baptized too. Some of you, they may be shocked. You may be thinking, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that Jesus was baptized too. Well, that makes me think, should, should, if Jesus is baptized, then shouldn't I? Oh, maybe I'm better than, right? Right? Well, I don't need to be baptized, but I see Jesus was, but I don't need to be. Is that, is that right thinking? No. There's a purpose behind what's taking place here. There's a reason why it's being called out and why it's being mentioned. Jesus was baptized and so should you. It says, and he was praying and heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. This is the Father speaking from heaven. The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus, the Son. This is one of those moments where we get to see all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son all together in a moment. You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. If it pleases God, shouldn't we do it? Yeah. Now, Luke says, now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. That's kind of a, a note there that, that, okay, this has taken place, and now, now here's the chronological time frame. Jesus is 30 years old. It's 30 years since he was born, right? And now he's ready to start sharing the good news about his coming, about why he came, about who God is, and how big this story is for all the people. Now, before he does, something's going to take place. And so often this happens. When we have big ideas, we have big notions, we have, we have big plans, often there's something that takes place before that plan ever takes feet or takes action. It says, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness praying and fasting. And throughout that time of dedication and preparation, Satan came and tempted him trying to stop him from doing the very thing he set out to do. This is a pivotal time in Jesus' life. The enemy came to test his resolve, his, his resolution, his character, and to lure him away from the mission and the purpose he had been sent to do. And we're going to look at the interaction, right? Right? The temptations, what is it? Why did it take place? How did Jesus reflect? How did Jesus answer, deflect, or overcome that temptation? This is so relevant that we talk about it now. Because no matter what your resolution was, or may or may not have set, I can tell you this for sure. God wants to accomplish amazing things through your life and in your life. But he has to be involved in all of it. Not just part of it, all of it. But Satan wants to ruin those plans before they ever begin. 
How many times have we said, man, I want to do this, right? And, and, I, and I want to do that, and, and I want to do this for Jesus, and then something happens in your life, and it gets wrecked. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. But why? Because it came upon him at baptism, right? That's when you and I received the Holy Spirit. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan where he was being baptized by John and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Let me pause just for a moment and ask the question. See if you're paying attention. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? Careful how you answer it. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led him. Satan didn't lead him into the desert. The Holy Spirit led him into the desert. Satan met him there to tempt him. Right? He came to them. God knows that temptation is going to take place in your life. Fact. Right? It's going to happen. It's not a surprise to God that you're going to be tempted. This temptation took place before Jesus' public ministry so that he could be tested and proven to be full of the Holy Spirit and ready to serve God in every capacity. Now this happens in our own lives. Right? Anytime you plan something big, we're... Jan and I are talking about planning a vacation. And every time we begin to talk about it, it's like something comes up. where We get interrupted, right? Anybody else have a similar situation where you begin to talk about something that you're looking forward to and then something comes up and you're like, why can't we just sit down and plan this? Or why can't we talk about this without something bad sneaking in? It happens in our own lives, and we need to go through a season of testing, a season of preparation before we're ready to be trusted with the greater responsibility of what God is going to ask us to do, lead us to do, whether it's in leadership or influence or inviting people in our community. We are going to be challenged to do something that we're going to find all kinds of excuses not to do that. Are you ready? Are you ready? I don't think you're ready. Well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm private about my religious beliefs, right? I don't feel comfortable inviting people to church. Well, then maybe we're not the right church. Maybe we're not there yet where we're the kind of church that you want to invite people to. Why can't we get there? Why can't we be that kind of church? It begins with a mindset change that our purpose is to bring people to Christ, and by doing that, we have to invest in them, in a friendship, in a community, and then we get to invite them into a relationship and see what it looks like to live with Christ. That has to change in us. But I can tell you, Satan's going to attack us every step of the way. Jesus says that it is those who have been faithful with a few things who will be put in charge of many things. Are you trustworthy? Do you have resolve? Does your want to overcome the temptations? Why 40 days? Why, why was Jesus in the desert for 40 days at 40 nights? Some would say it's to 
to kind of show that that's the same period of time that the Israelite people, 40 years, they were wandering in the desert. That maybe Jesus is embodying the body or the nation of Israel. I don't know. But it does make a little sense. Luke chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of, end of those days, he was hungry. Duh, right? The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, this is the first interaction that we see recorded in Scripture where Satan comes to Jesus and says, you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Well, turn that stone into bread, and you can eat. Why did he wait to the end of 40 days? Because Satan's no dummy. He attacks at your weakest moment. When you have three, five, eight, ten years sobriety, you get this comfortable. I don't have to worry about that anymore, right? That's when he's coming because you're vulnerable. Your guard is down. Or maybe you've been sober for a week and you think, well, I've only been sober for a week. Nobody has any more expectations than that. I could just, I could just jump back in and start over really, right? Satan will attack you at your most vulnerable moments. That's why he waited. When Jesus' stomach and hunger was the greatest, that's when he tempts him. Did you know, now this makes sense, did you know that the ancient kings, they had a habit of, 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 of a way that they would try to win the influence or win the popularity or become famous with people before they ever took the throne? They would borrow large sums of money from people who supported them. This is going to sound really familiar when we start talking about politics, right? They're going to borrow large sums of money from people, and they will buy bread in all the cities. And they will buy that bread, and they will give it away for weeks on end until the people are dependent upon the bread. And then they will make their move, their power play, for the throne. And once they get on the throne, guess what's, what stops happening? No more bread. They've achieved what they wanted. They won your favor. They won your vote by feeding your stomach. And then once they have what they want, they're done with you. They have no intention of delivering on what they promised. They say things that you want to hear in order to win favor. With that in mind, do you remember what happens to Jesus when he feeds 5,000 people with a couple of fish and a couple of pieces of bread? Do you remember what happens? John 6, verse 15 said they tried to make him king by force. They had seen this played out before. They had seen Julius Caesar do it himself. They had seen uh, Caesar Augustus do it. They, they had seen kings before that, and they knew the stories about how kings did this. And so, why wouldn't they assume the same about Jesus? Let's make him king. He filled our stomachs. Turning a rock into bread isn't about Jesus feeding himself. It's about Satan tempting Jesus to be the sort of king that the world knows. Do you see that? With the historic background and the context we now have, do you see that? Satan is saying, 
hey, feed yourself, man. You can feed all these other people, and then you'll be the king. You'll be the sort of king that gains a following by spectacular miracles, winning of people's hearts through their stomachs, creating dependency upon you rather than preaching God's word and doing what you really called to come do. This would be much easier. Just feed the people. Feed yourself first and then feed the people. And Jesus sees through Satan's scheme. Jesus answered with a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. In Luke chapter 4, verse 4, he says, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Now, how many times have you read that, right? And thought, okay, I think I kind of get it. And then now this historical background, a little bit of depth, right? You kind of have a moment where you go, okay, I I see it now. It's not about filling your stomach. Jesus came with a bigger purpose. This makes so much sense. Jesus didn't come to fill your stomach. He came to save you from your sins. Do you see how Satan wants to shortcut the mission? I can make you famous overnight. And you can avoid all the hard stuff. And after this first temptation, there comes a second. And verses 5 through 7, it says, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Rome. Egypt. Assyria. All those great nations. And he said to Jesus, I will give you all, the, all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. <laughs> it's interesting because... Satan takes Jesus to a place where he can see all the kingdoms, a a beautiful, spectacular view, right? A scenic place to stop and go, whoa, look at all the nations of the world. He takes him to this place, and he tells Jesus that he can have all of that. It can all be yours if you worship and adore me. I'm not talking about all the time, but just in this moment, just, just in this moment, say I'm better than you. Or say that I'm equal with God. Just in this moment, you don't have to say it to anybody else, just say it to me. Right? I don't know if that's what he said, but I can imagine sometimes. Satan is is lying, right? We all know that Jesus himself created everything in this world. The nations included belong to him. These aren't nations for Satan to give away. They're not his to begin with. And and that's how Satan works. He uses a little bit, right? He has authority here for a little while. He has a temporary kingdom set up. But we all know he doesn't have ultimate authority, right? So how can he say, Jesus, I can give this all to you, man. It's like you giving me a hundred bucks, right? And I say, hey, man, I could give this back to you if you want it. Wait, it was mine to begin with, right? It's, it's that little bit of a, a truth that he twists into a greater lie. Satan has never been interested in speaking the whole truth. Most of his deceptions come from a little bit of truth twisted into a lie. What's crazy is Satan's trying to give Jesus something that Jesus already has. At the heart of the temptation, Satan is trying to get Jesus to shortcut God's plan. 
Jesus knows that when he defeats death, overcomes death, that he will sit on the throne of heaven and all the nations will be at his feet. But he has to go through that first. And Satan is saying, listen, you don't have to go to the cross. I can give it to you right now. Every single one of us face temptations like this. There are things, there are good things that we desire and want. Our, our resolutions are, are, are peppered full of them, right? No one, no one woke up this morning and said, hey, I'm going to carry through with my resolution of being a drunk the rest of the year. That's not what you thought. No, they are good things. Things that God plans for us. But what I want you to know, those things have to come in God's timing, not yours and not shortcutted by Satan. In order to get it now, you'll have to take shortcuts. You'll have to hurt others along the way. You'll have to take your eyes off of Jesus Christ. You'll have to make choices that you will regret. You might get it right now, but you will not enjoy it while you have it. You know what I'm talking about, right? You will regret the shortcuts and the deception that you bought into. Jesus said to Satan, verse 8, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. I am choosing not to to shortcut. I am choosing to follow God no matter what the trials, what the, whatever I'm going to face. I am, I am fixed and focused and bought in. I am devoted to following God. Jesus will remain faithful. He will wait. He will suffer. He will surrender. And He will sacrifice in order to do the very thing that God called Him to do. Save us. Verse 9 through 11. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, the highest point of the temple has been recorded at 450 feet to the valley below. That's a long way. Satan is saying, if you are the Son of God, jump off. The angels will protect you. Besides that, it's going to prove to everybody you're the Messiah because the angels surely will not let you die. The temptation is not for Jesus to commit holy suicide and prove that the angels will save him. No, the temptation is for Jesus to become famous in the moment. How many, if I say the word evil can evil, right? And many of you right away go, I know who that guy is. He's a stunt man, right? And he's famous, right? Jesus came to lead people to the Father to preach the kingdom of God and to give his life for salvation to the world. He didn't come to become a stuntman or become famous by jumping off the temple. Again, the temptation is designed to, to ruin God's purpose and mission. And Luke chapter 12, or Luke chapter 4, verse 12 through 13 says, Jesus said, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. Jesus would rather be faithful than to be famous. Jesus didn't show up. He didn't take advantage of God. He, he didn't press God at the moment where uh, I, I'm going to make you do this. 
And notice that Scripture says that the devil left Jesus for an opportune time. There are going to be many times when Satan shows up again. But probably one of the most opportune times is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hours before Jesus will be arrested. Hours before he'll be sent to the cross. Satan will come to him and try to convince Jesus to avoid the cross. To circumvent the plan. Take the easy way or push the easy button. But here's what you need to know. No matter how many times Satan tries to wreck Jesus, Jesus overcomes Satan every time. Every time. We need to learn from that. To get the most out of this message, we need to define temptation. Temptation is like fishing. Or maybe it's like hunting. Right? How many duck hunters or goose hunter, I don't know how you say that, right? Uh, geese hunters, right? Yeah. <laughs> you put out decoys, right? Tempting, and, and you have these, right? You do that? I'm terrible at it. Turkey hunters, fishermen, we throw lures in order to tempt and entice them to bite. But every time, you and I know <laughs> It doesn't end well for the animal we're enticing, right? We're tempting. Satan is doing the same thing. Temptation is a lure. And Satan does the same thing. He tries to deceive us, to lure us in. But there's always a hook. The purpose is to destroy and to kill and to break your relationship with Jesus Christ. The devil uses what is most appealing to each and every one. If it's not the same lure, it's not the same temptation for each of us. He will use sex and power and money, pleasure, acceptance, position, even the promise of love. Every temptation is basically the same. It promises what it can't give. And his purpose is to destroy you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. But listen, here's how you can counter every temptation. Cultivate a spirit of gratitude and contentment with what you have in Jesus Christ. You already have the power to beat temptation. His name is Jesus Christ. And this will neutralize the attacks and the opportunities that come. Jesus defeated Satan in the garden. Jesus defeats Satan in the wilderness. Jesus defeats Satan in our hearts. The idea or the having the confidence or the faith to say, no, thank you. I'm confident that Jesus has given me everything I need, that I am grateful and that my heart is content and filled with the joy that he gives. Not in the things I want. In our prayer life, instead of primarily asking God for things that we want, thank him for the things that you have, the what he has done for you, to cultivate a gratitude and trust in God. Listen, we're going to sing here in a moment, and I, and I want you to really to think about the words. And I, and I pray that, that the words that you would speak would, would be confident and build within you a gratitude for what Jesus has done because He is more than enough. The fight will continue until you are home. The temptations can be overcome, but you cannot do it on your own. Let's stand and praise Him.